Welcome to the Living Life Juicy Podcast, where we explore how we can be present and kind as we do great things. You can find the Living Life Juicy Podcast on YouTube or on your favorite podcast platforms. Uh, you might also want to check out the Growing People Podcast and blog. And also, if you want to find out more about the Into Wisdom Group, you can go to intowisdomgroup.com. Uh, I also just put out a book, so if you're curious about what the Pottery Panda is about, you can go to PotteryPanda.com and read about what people are saying about it and also get your own copy. Today, we're chatting with Lee Sheridan. I first met Lee back when we were both working at Farmers, and uh, he was a standout participant in several different leadership programs uh, I was involved in uh, in delivering. He left the security of his corporate position to buy and run Two Maids and a Mop, a cleaning service franchise. He's transitioned from a corporate animal uh, to an entrepreneur, and I'm excited to learn more about his uh, transitions and journey. So, Lee, welcome. Thanks, John. It's good to be here. I appreciate the invite. Yeah. So tell me, uh, like, I don't like to give too much away about what who you are and what you do. How do you describe what you do to people who don't know you? Well, you know, I, I like to tell people I, I, I give family time back in, in their day, time back in their, their week. Um, so I've, I've essentially become a serial entrepreneur since, since 2017, but the primary business that we have is teammates, and we give people time back in their lives to do things that they would prefer to do versus need to do. Yeah. So you went into like you got that franchise and dove into it, but you mentioned that you're a serial entrepreneur. So what does that look like for you? What does that really mean? You know, and, and I've, I've, I've said this to several folks that once you kind of get out of corporate America, um, I think in corporate America you have a very myopic view of, of your world. Um, this is your job. This is your responsibility. These are the people who you are responsible for. Um, and I think you, you, you kind of get tunnel vision with regards to, to what your objective is. Um, when I left Hope America and, and started uh, Open Two Maids uh, Virginia Beach, I started realizing there's other needs within our community. Uh, I realized there's other needs within the industry. Um, and essentially, that spun off to another business called Beach Hospitality Services. Um, Beach Hospitality provide equipment for the short-term rental market, so things are being used, VRBO, things like that. Um, we have a significant uh, vacation rental market here in southeastern Virginia, so there's nobody else who is doing what I was doing, which is providing an end-to-end service. Uh, we provide all of the linen, towels, paper products, soap products. Um, we provide the cleaning service for the two maids, so I guess I outsource or insource myself for that company. Um, and then we also have the back end uh, laundry service. So we'll wash the linen and towels and all that stuff. If you want to use your own stuff, we can do that, but we charge by the pound then for, for the laundry. Um, so we were an end to end service and started marketing that. So again, getting out of a, a, a myopic view of what I'm supposed to do, started. I started looking to see right, what, what other services can I offer. Um, COVID hit, so we had to pivot, right? So what other services can we offer? Um, that turned into when COVID hit and people got out of offices, well, now we got a lot of commercial real estate available. So I, I now am involved with commercial real estate. Um, so it's just, once you kind of open your eyes and see what opportunity is there, um, it, it was something that, that was, when I say serial entrepreneur, I'm not done yet. There's other opportunities you got out of the corporate world and you bought a franchise and then a couple of years into that you now did you start the second franchise before covid or after covid during covid oh during covid yep. wow brave move yeah well it was it was defense more than offense right so um covid was probably one of the best things that could have happened uh to the cleaning industry um, you know, I, I equate it to the, the, the scene in Forrest Gump where they're the only ship out at sea during the storm, right? And, and essentially they come back from the hurricane and there's ships all over the place, but they're not in the water. That was us. We were pretty much the only ship at sea. Um, we did a ton of marketing. 
the guerrilla marketing, um, you name it, we did it. We were top of mind. We were on the radio. Um, we were essentially in front of everybody. So when, because it was only two weeks, remember? Um, so when that was over, people called their other cleaning companies that were either out of business or they furloughed their employees or they laid them off. Um, mom and pop shops were gone, right? Because if you only had a small customer base and half of that customer base in the your house, they're gone. So we went from a long list of competitors to a very short list of competitors and I pumped money into Google and everything else so that we were populating one or two. So we got those phone calls and we and we tripled in uh we tripled in about two years. Um and which led us to you know essentially purchase some real estate and do some other stuff. Um so that's kind of how that works. Yeah. Well, before we keep going forward, because I want to go there. Let's go back because I want to hear a little bit more about uh, how you got to where you're at today. Kind of the the origin story of Lee. Where did you come from, and how did you get to where you're at today? How far back we going? Not nah, don't start as a child, but <laughs> so I started my insurance career in '97. '97, uh, fresh out of college with uh, Shelby Insurance. Uh, moved around a bunch with Chubb Insurance, but opened the service center. Uh, I was working the service center here in Chubby, Virginia, opened the service center out in uh, Phoenix, um, and essentially progressed through the ranks. Um, I really enjoyed what I did. I really enjoyed who I worked with. Um, and then, you know, went from there, opened up the first AIG operation uh, here in, in Southeastern Virginia, progressed through the ranks uh, AIG. Um, and then when the AIG was acquired uh, by Zurich and farmers, uh, and essentially, you know, worked with you know, one of the farmers. And we started as a state manager um, and, and, and moved to a regional position. Um, and then the management went to the and then essentially we landed in the strategy department. So the agency strategy manager, uh, when I resigned from farmers, when that was in 2017. Um, which was a difficult decision, but as you know, later on that year in 2017, there was a, there was a significant reduction in force, which you know, unfortunately happened recently as well. Um, and not to say I saw the writing on the wall, I certainly didn't. Um, I was done. I was burned out. There was no two ways about it. Tell me more about like what moved you out. The, I mean, you might have seen the writing on the wall, but were there other factors? There's burnout. What else got you to think in terms of something so off the wall? I, you don't see many uh, insurance executives take the turn towards housekeeping. No. And so what the original plan was, because, um, yeah, you're right, John. <laughs> it's not it's not that was not my bliss, you know, as a senior in, in, in high school figuring out what I want to do when I grow up. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out, but what the uh, the plan was was to purchase a data um, and to have it as an asset, right? So it was essentially a financial engine, in my opinion, to leverage down the road, right? So when I re retired or whatever, I had another asset. Um, so I really was looking at it as a place to you know, stash money, for lack of a better term, right? So. Um, the, the the original plan was to purchase, and, and I and I went through um, as a franchise consultant and things like that. Um, and they just helped me narrow down, you know, what would work, given the demographics of my area, and you know, pretty much the fact that this area is growing. This area is not necessarily impacted by Wall Street. Um, this is a Navy town, a military town. Um, as long as we're building ships and slinging bombs, we're we're, we're going to be we're going to be fine. Um, so given the fact that we have a lot of military in and out, it just seemed like the home services business would, would be good. Um, so I landed on two maids because not only was the model appropriate, it was appropriately priced, um, and there was a high demand in this area for this type of service. So the original plan was I was going to purchase it, I'm going to hire a manager, um, and have that manager run, right? I would a lot of that, you know, we did we work remotely. Right when I wasn't traveling, I was home, so I could set up shop in, in the office, the tomato office. I could be a presence when I'm here, um, but not necessarily need to be there all the time. Uh, so that was the original plan going into 2017. 
Um, I had some meetings late 2016, early 2017, that I just couldn't, I, I really had a hard time accepting the outcome, right? It seemed like it got very difficult to do very easy things, very logical things, right? It just seemed extremely difficult to kind of push those things through um, with no hidden agenda whatsoever, but for, in, in my opinion, what we did, we were responsible for our stakeholders, we were responsible for our insurers, we were decisions that would lower our cost of doing business and potentially increase customer service and things along those lines. As well as technology was coming into play, we had to leverage technology, which I think was a big thing that, that impacted 2017 layoffs, is we're leveraging more technology than we were individuals, and that obviously is going to have an impact on headcount. Um, so I had some meetings that I just it, they, they, I struggled with accepting the outcomes, the decisions. Um, I had a very difficult time leading a team in an environment that I internally didn't potentially agree with. Um, so that's what really kind of really helped me make my decision. And also, my wife was done with me traveling 60, 70% of the time. She was done. I mean, our kids were little. Um, she traveled about 25% of the time, and I made her a, a single parent for most of the time. So I was done. Uh, I was just absolutely done. And I remember making my decision, and I made two phone calls. I was in a meeting in my life. Um, we had a break. I made two phone calls. I called my wife. I said, today is the day. I can't do it anymore. Today's the day. It was Thursday. Uh, I called the CEO of two mates. I said, today's the day. We're flipping the script here. I'm going to run it, and we're all you know, I'll, I'll be done here in two weeks. That was it. I uh, that was a Thursday. I was supposed to be was supposed to be until Friday. I attended my resignation. I took the red eye home. Yeah. Well, not everybody has that kind of clarity about when they're done. What do you think? Were uh, like, if you can identify some of those signals, I mean, you said you couldn't get uh, some of the easy stuff done that you thought would be easy. What were some of the other signals that just told you you were done? You know, the, the position I had was with a strategy manager. You know, you have a ton of responsibility, a ton of responsibility, because your, your strategies are going to impact the organization as a whole, um, or at least your, your, your line of business as a whole. But you don't have a lot of authority. So when everybody agrees that this is the strategy we're going to leverage and this is the direction we're going to go, but you really don't have the leverage to make sure those things get done, it's somewhat defeated, right? So it, I can't force everybody to, to do these things, but we've got the information that suggests this is the appropriate course of action. It's been proven. We see great results with these people that are doing it. This strategy is effective. Yeah, I don't want to do it. No, I can't force you to do it, but you need to do it, right? So that was that was a, a difficult pill to swallow. In addition to that, like the, the travel was just overwhelming. The travel was overwhelming. In addition to that, there were so many changes within the organization that it was almost impossible to have any continuity of thought or any continuity of execution. And when you're in a strategy position, you need continuity of execution. And we just couldn't find it. So those were a lot of the reasons that really made me flip that switch and make no mistake about it. My wife and I had discussed it. And there's no way I could, I could possibly do this if my wife didn't have a fantastic, you know, position and, and you know, she works from home and she was extremely supportive. My family was extremely supportive. They knew I was miserable. They knew it. They, they knew it would just begrudgingly you know, drive away to the airport on a Monday morning and be excited to come home for a couple of days. So they knew I was miserable. They knew that, you know, this was the decision and, and given my attitude and given my uh the way I'm built, it was going to be successful. Yeah, I think when I look back at my time at Farmers, I probably stayed on maybe a year and a half, two years longer than I should. And I didn't choose my exit. I was exited. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, you know, unlike what's happened this week in, uh, you know, September of uh, 2023, where a lot of our farmers friends 
woke up on a Monday morning and found out that they were gone, I had a, there's a bit of a process and I had warning. And by the time it actually happened, I knew I, I could have stayed and taught people how to climb ladders or something, but I knew that there were other people who should stay and I should go and reopen my consulting business. And, you know, I think like all those signs that you saw and you acted on, I saw and I didn't act on. But when I was out, my wife told me, hey, I've never seen you happier in the past 10 years because, you know, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And I wasn't just living through the the edicts of the, I was at the corporate university and got a chance to do amazing things and got stuff thrown on my desk uh, to investigate and implement. But ultimately, it was like I was I was ready to go and I didn't take that. What do you think gave you the confidence to step away from the security of a, of a corporate paycheck? So that's, that's a great question. And, and, and so I think what gave me that confidence is what I learned in corporate America by folks like you, um, other mentors that I've had. Um, I learned to be a good leader. I learned to take calculated risk. Um, I learned, you know, how to reason. Um, I saved a lot of money, right? I mean, I made good decisions financially. Um, so I think those things combined gave me the level of confidence. And, you know, I kind of tell people, and I mentor a lot of, you know, new businesses and, and new franchises and things like that. And I tell people, the difficult thing is when you become an entrepreneur, you know, when you work for Corporate America or somebody else, you know, they hand you they hand you your meal every two weeks, right? You don't. Here you go. Here you, here you go. Here it's different, right? You know, I've got to scout. I've got to hunt. I've got to kill. I've got to clean. And I got to cook my own food. When you do that, there's a, there's a bit of a different push and drive to make sure that not only you can, but I've got 30 employees, right? So we got to make sure the decisions that we make really impact that appropriately. Um, so it's a, it's a different drive behind that thought process. Um, and I will tell you, it didn't take me long after leaving uh, farmers in corporate America um, that that's, that's, we're going to have to change the perspective a little bit. And, and we did. And we've been very, very effective at it. Yeah. So when you stepped away from the corporate role, what what did you bring with you from that role, from that position, that was beneficial as a entrepreneur and franchise owner. What were some of the like the assets that were really helpful uh, from your experience uh, in corporate America? So I will tell you, there was a big push years ago around emotional intelligence. I'm sure you remember. Yes. Um, and I did that stuff, kicking and screaming like this is come on. So emotional intelligence was number one. Um, leadership, number two. Um, this is, I'm a people manager, right? I mean, granted, I own a cleaning company and some other businesses, but at the end of the day, this is people business. People do business, people they know, like, and trust. So we are extremely gentle, right? I don't, I don't hide anything. We're transparent with our customers. We're transparent with our employees. So I think that level of transparency and, and just being genuine. And you know, we saw people thriving, right? We really, really did. People sometimes have more money than time, or you know, they come home and they go into a horrible environment that they just can't take care of. So we can come in there and we can really do something and have an impact on people mentally, physically, emotionally. So I would say one of the biggest things that I leverage from my time in corporate America is learning about emotional intelligence. And understanding how to appropriately manage people so that everybody wins. They feel they're listened to, they feel rewarded. And I still at the end of the day have a happy employee that's effective in the field. Yeah. So I want to get more into what emotional intelligence just looks like in your new role, but I also want to find out a little bit about what were some of the the hurdles or or obstacles that you brought with you from corporate America into entrepreneurship and franchise? What got in your way? Well, you know, <laughs> a lot. You know, there's a, there's a ton of scar tissue um, that I had to overcome. 
The, the biggest thing is in corporate America, you have you have resources, right? Like my computer craps out. Well, call the IT department, right? Hey, I got an issue with my credit card or you know, finance, we'll call the finance department. Hey, you know, these spreadsheets don't look good. You know, got to send it back so I'm gonna manipulate those spreadsheets. I mean, you are all of those departments. That's it. I could take the phone call to America and call Peter and say, Hey, listen, I have this issue with you know an employee or the situation or my manager. What do you think? And commiserate and stuff. That's gone. That's all gone. That network has immediately vanished. It, it, it doesn't exist. So that was probably the biggest issue that, that I really had to overcome. In addition to that, somebody in corporate America is holding you accountable, right? Somebody's making sure you're logging in and responding to emails. And, oh, well, that's gone too. Right, that's gone. So if I didn't want to get up, then I didn't get up. You know, if I didn't want to respond to emails, I didn't want to respond to you. If I want to answer the phone, I answer the phone. Well, that's that, right? And, and so your motivation, because quite honestly, if there's nobody kind of barking at you, then your motivation could really connect. Um, so I figured that out. I was really, really ambitious to get the place open. Um, and we opened April 17th, 2017. So Dell Farmers in February. It wasn't, you know, two months later, we were open. So, I mean, from February to April, I was looking for office space. I was looking for equipment. I was looking to hire people. I was building websites, doing all this stuff. So, um, when we opened, you think the phone's ran off the hook. It's not. You know, it's, you got to wait for search engine optimization. So, again, I told you, you got to hunt, kill, clean, cook, all your food, right? So, nobody's calling. <laughs> so, you got to go out and got to make it work. Um so there's a there's a lot that essentially goes into it, but the uh, the initial couple months was was extremely difficult. Yeah, I I, I know what it means when you, in, you you change departments by changing apps on your computer. That's mm -hmm. and it's all sitting at your desk. The other thing, it's it's kind of a two edged sword having to shift to that intrinsic motivation. There's nobody out there you're accountable to other than you. Yep. And there's there's some people who need that external accountability. Otherwise, you know, you have trouble getting up. My guess is you probably had to temper yourself um, from overworking and not having boundaries because it's all you and you own it so much, especially when the phone's not ringing, that it yeah, can it, it can turn into something that's not healthy. Yeah. And so, you know, I and the the entrepreneur just mindset is different, but also the there is a group of a tremendous group of entrepreneurs everywhere, right? They're a unique group and they will find each other. Uh, I joined a networking group um, and that was great. It was great for accountability. It was great just to meet other people because when you're an entrepreneur, you are, you're fighting a 10 sided you know, war on an island, right? So, I mean, everything is different, right? You're really the only guy who's got the answer. So I learned a lot from in networking. I met a lot of great people. I joined an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, um, which is a global organization. Essentially, they take businesses that are a quarter million dollars, get them over a million dollars, and once we're over a million dollars, the objective is to get you over five million dollars. And it is the top entrepreneurs in your area. It is a fantastic organization. I'm on the board of it now. Um, I, I do a, a global a student entrepreneurial award uh, where we have uh, college students essentially do like a Shark Tank type thing. Um, but that organization not only saved my life, but like I've 10x my business since I joined it. And the thing on the wall there is essentially my graduation from um, you know the one group to the next level up. Um, and it is it is a group I can't live without. It is my board of directors. I have a meeting once a month for four hours with six other business owners that are in my forum. We tear apart each other's businesses. We identify what's going right, what's going wrong. We, we, we have fixes. We have we bring in speakers to, to help us out. Um, it is an organization that I would not be, you wouldn't want to talk to me because I wouldn't have made a splash without them. So um, because of that, I mean, we're the second largest cleaning company in and the two-made network and was the largest cleaning company in Southeast Virginia. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's I I always push people towards the community. Uh, you've got to have a community that's supporting you. And I think that uh, with the type of business you have, those networking groups are so crucial because they, you know, you get together, I would imagine you get a realtor in there and you get all kinds of referrals and you can give referrals to them. So those, that's awesome. And I like the idea of a, a board of directors that you have that are all entrepreneurs. Now, uh, and being able to put your stuff out there and feel that uh, support encouragement, accountability, feedback. Um, that's that everybody needs that. And entrepreneurs tend to be solopreneurs and will isolate themselves unless they do like what you did and find this group of people to step in. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about how, because we, I think we first met in some of the other leadership programs like MLD or those are the acronyms are what comes out of farmers. But the last one we did together was something called the presidential leadership program, which was about emotional, and social competencies, storytelling and communication. And I'm wondering what that looks like in entrepreneurial wor world. How do you apply what you learned about emotional intelligence with where you're at right now? So I would tell you that storytelling is, is huge. Right. I think that is something that people can identify with, people can connect with and just ask questions about that, that makes it very engaging. Um, because of the demographic that when we hire, um, you know, they they there's, there's a little bit of a disadvantage demographic, right? So they have a hard time with trust. They have a hard time, you know, making good long-term decisions. Um, so I leverage a lot of storytelling. Say, listen, you know, I knew somebody, or I worked with somebody. Um, this was their situation. And this was this is what happened, and you know, I really refrain from giving people advice as much as I I try to do an experience share. Right. So here's the thing that I've done, or I've witnessed that have had a very more impact. Or I could draw, you know, a, a friend of mine that has had a, a similar situation. Um, but from, you know, we talk about the leadership program, it's really about understanding the individual versus the situation, right? Because the situation is situational, right? So where is this person actually coming from? And that's difficult. Um, it's a little bit more difficult in this environment because corporate America everybody's has at least that, that core understanding we are in the insurance industry, we're in the claims industry, we're in this. Here's a little bit different, right? Because they really don't have industry specific examples or they just don't have that core. Um, so having the ability to leverage the emotional intelligence that I learned um, has really put us in a favorable position to attract not only customers, but employees. And more importantly, John, retain them because in this business, people, I mean, this is a revolving door, right? So if something that say here, you know, they're going to say because they feel valued, they feel listened to. They are rewarded appropriately, things like that. So we've been able to create an environment and a culture that people stay in because it benefits them not only with money, but also as an individual. Yeah. And I think you hit something important that's across the board in entrepreneurial world, but also in any organization that you're with. It's about um, understanding why people stay but also the people who leave, when you're in a high turnover situation, that's just, that's the nature of the beast. You want the people who leave to be your biggest recruiters. So if they leave you and they say, man, working with Lee at Two Maids was the best thing that ever happened to me. Well, why'd you leave? Well, I wanted to progress in my career, but man, if you want, a, if you want a great place to be, that's the place to be. And any organization is gonna benefit from that. And that's, I think uh, one of the things that I landed on about leadership and in fact, I'll talk about leadership development, but the reality is all the stuff we teach in leadership development courses and the manager training and all that kind of stuff, it just makes anybody a better employee. So I've I've moved to talk about you do technical training and professional training. And all the professional training topics are the same, whether you're an individual contributor, a new supervisor, or a director. The topics are all the same. The context is a little different. But man, if you, uh, right when people walk in, as an entrepreneur, if you're building something from scratch, every person who steps in, you you are going to hire their technical proficiency. 
they don't need additional training uh, unless you made a bad hire or you notice gaps that aren't there. What they need is to become healthier professionals. Right. And so I would say like, as part of your recruiting, your training, your onboarding, putting professional aspects of, um, you know, even like team building, they're they're not going to be hiring a team, but they're going to be part of a team and understanding that dynamic. And I'm not talking trust falls. Right. I'm talking how you actually work together on things. I think um, like coaching, uh, individual contributors will coach each other. And if they understand how to develop people, they will coach up and make you a better leader. Uh, we talk about, uh, I talk about uh, quality thinking, critical thinking, whatever it is. Anybody who can make better decisions and, and has good judgment is going to add to the value of the organization. Emotional intelligence. I remember like we would go to different conferences that, uh, you know, a, an APD regional conference, and you would always bring in some old salt adjuster to talk with the leaders. And I'd usually end up sitting with them in the crowd and you guys are talking leadership and all that. And they're leaning over to me and say, wow, I do that. That's how I got to be where I'm at. I would just wish it wasn't 30 years to get it, you know? So I got this information that everybody um, needs professional development, regardless of what level the organization. Yep. And if you wait, uh, you know, the only people who understand that everybody's a leader are people who've been through a leadership development course. If you haven't, a leader is somebody who people report to. And right. so if you if you call it leadership development, they're going to push it away and say, I don't want to become administration. I love what I do. I just want to get better at what I do. And so when you talk professional development, you say, what kind of professional do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be out in the world? And now we're talking all the stuff we talked about at our leadership programs, at the emotional intelligence stuff, that becomes relevant to everybody who works for us. Yeah. And when we talk about, you know, and again, on the heels of, of what happened in, in September uh, 2023 with, with farmers, talk about what's the most transferable skill, right? It, it, it is the leadership component. It is the emotional intelligence component. Um, it is the ability to kind of critical think through issues, right? So, um, you know, and, and we accept here that this is a, I don't want to say a revolving door, so I don't like the term. But we tell people in orientation, we understand that this is a pass to the job. I own it, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it right back in the face. We understand that this is a pass to the job. We understand it, we accept it. Um, but when you're here, we wanna make you better. And I wanna know what do you wanna be when you grow up? What's your next step? What do you wanna do? And I'll tell you what, we act on that, right? So I have a young lady now who just started going back to school. I'm actually gonna off on Monday. Um, she wants to do interior design. But guess what? One of my networking groups of an interior designer. I asked her if she wanted to meet this young lady. She's like, oh yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna hook them up, right? So I'm following through on something that probably she probably thought I was it, it was it was disingenuous initially, right? Um, but it's not. I mean, in my opinion, you know, you can talk about like, you know, the Simon Sink, you know, start start with why. My why is to help people. It really, really is. You know, I understand that that they may not come from a place where somebody was helping them or they had a mentor or they had somebody to trust. So let me help you. Right? We've done budgeting classes. We talk, talk about how to buy a car, how to buy a house. You know, we had insurance people come in. We're trying to educate people, right? So, and because of that, they can go home and tell their friends and tell their husband or their wife, look what I learned if they work there, right? Instead of, I just went out and, you know, cleaned five houses there. You know, so we do things differently because I think it's a gap um, with a certain demographic that adds value to not only the relationship that I have with them, but the relationship they have with others, which we've seen a significant impact. And again, that's why we've seen the one that we have. And then they become your best recruiters. Yeah. If you know that, I mean, you acknowledge that very few people, not, a, not everybody, but very few people view house cleaning as a career opportunity but they do view it as a good place to be for a while. Yep. And if you could make that a great place to be for a while, they will replace themselves. And there's so many different businesses right now that are just having trouble. Well, I would say there's trouble in matching. There's people looking for jobs and there's people looking to hire people and they're not matching. 
And if you can, uh, like the person leaving who's saying, hey, let me sneak you into this wonderful organization, then like you've just done a huge service to your recruiting. Yep. And you'll always have, when somebody passes through, they will find a replacement for themselves. Now, well, I know it's not about, as easy as that. But. Yeah, we see about 30% of the people that leave here come back. So 30% of the people that leave, you're going to leave on good times, right? And, and because we create, you know, a favorable culture, normally I get two weeks. I get my notice, you know, so it's not like they're just not showing up, which is commonplace in the service industry, right? People just, oh, I don't want to work there anymore. They don't come in anymore. We don't see that, right? They give us a two week. Um, and the ones that do, usually within, you know, a couple months or a couple weeks, they're calling and saying, hey, I'd like to come back. And go, All right, come on back. We're welcome with open arms, right? Especially if they left on this time, which most of them do. Um, but I mean, that, that to me is something that I'm, I'm very, very, very proud of because there's a lot of jobs out there. Now they're, they're comfortable here. They left on this time, things like that. But like 30% end up coming back. Yeah. And I think so the big thing during uh during COVID was the uh the great uh re, you know leaving or whatever they call it. And I thought it was, it's more of a great reshuffle. Yeah. Because people like they were away, they had time to think about uh and question whether it was whatever they were doing was a healthy place. And then they looked. And so you have this great reshuffle where people were leaving. And I think one of the things that motivated that was, I want to find a place that's going to take care of me. Now, I, I don't think that's a healthy attitude. Um, but it is healthy if if like where they're at, if it's toxic, if it's not healthy, if I'll, then yeah, leave. But you will never find a company that's going to take care of you. You'll find a better workplace, you'll find more healthy work environment. But no organization is going to look out for your health well, or for your job. wellness or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's your job. Um, that's your organization's job. That's your job. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why I don't I don't talk about like work life balance anymore mm -hmm. because it's not up to the organization to fix that. Now they need to create a healthy, safe place for you to be, but ultimately it's your responsibility. And it's it's more about self-awareness. What are my needs? And then stepping in and managing yourself in a way where you're, you're you're being effective, and also your effectiveness is not up to the organization either. They need to create a place where you can excel, but ultimately, it's how you manage yourself that's going to be how you excel. And then I, I, I liken it to you know who Mike Rowe is, uh, uh, Dirty Jobs guy. Sure, sure. He has this thing called. Um, he started talking about safety third. And his thing was safety is much more important than for it to be first. And what he noticed was his crew would go out to these locations and they do this big safety brief where we'd say, you know, your safety is our top concern. It's number one. And all of his people started to rely on that company or that group for their own safety. And they saw people getting hurt more. Right. Because they weren't taking responsibility for themselves. They were abdicating. Right. And I see the same thing with like how you set up your workplace, number one, it needs to be physically, emotionally, socially, psychologically safe, but you can never guarantee that for anybody. And so having people understand locus of control, you do that. And I, that's empowering. I mean, it's not, and it's not passive. I think that's what brings people around to a healthy organization like yours is they go and shop around and they might get promises but they don't experience it until they realize, like like what you said, you don't give advice, you tell stories. And you give people the opportunity to gain competencies around budgeting, around insurance, around. And it's not you're not doing it for them. You're not handing it to them because, you know, that won't have any impact. But you're teaching them how to do it themselves. Yeah. One of our core values that we have, and I guess that's one of the things that's just important to have core values, have a mission statement, you know, we have it. Lash it out in the, in the main room. Um, one of the core values we have is talk about it, right? So communication. Is key. And I, I can't tell you how many times people come in and they'll, you know, be aggravated or frustrated, and like, you know, this has been bothering me for a week. Well, I'm like, look, that's your fault. That's your fault. This has been bothering me for a week. You should have come to me the first time it happened. We were talking about it. We figured out why is this happening. Can we change it? So don't come in here upset because your timeline is off. 
come in here and let's talk about what the issue is. Let's, let's do it from you know a, 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 a good place, right? So and we do. We, we have there's myself and I have three other managers here. We have a suggestion box. You have an anonymous texting uh, service where if you got something that's going on, you can anonymously send a text and it comes with manager. Um, so you've got what's that three, six, seven, six, five, six different modes of communication. So every time you ever come in here, you tell me this has been bothering me for weeks because uh, now that's your problem, right? I could have fixed it. I could have fixed it day one. So communication is a, is a huge deal here. So people come in and they're stressed out or they're overworked. That's something that you encourage people. Hey, listen, you type of time off, please request it. To show people as you know when we're already kind of blocked off like you know you're going to need a couple of days because whatever put it in so and we're very flexible along those lines so i do tell people i, I provide you know a, 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 a telehealth benefit i provide a life insurance policy i pay for all that and stuff and, uh, but i tell people all the time you're the person who has to be responsible for me when i start caring about you and your well-being more than you do we're done. Yeah, no. yeah, that's a that's a no win proposition. You're not going to be happy, and I can't satisfy you. Yeah, um, man, there's so much more I want to talk about with the entrepreneurial stuff and all that because I think um, for the people out there, I've got of my dozens of listeners, there are a bunch who consider themselves entrepreneurs, and I think you what you're speaking to is what you bring from the corporate world and understanding. Uh, man, there are benefits from that. And a lot of entrepreneurs reject anything that seems corporate yep. because they're they're pioneers and they want to be out there. But there's so many good things that you bring to the table on that. And I would also say for the people, um, the you know, if you're out there listening to this from a position with an organization, um, part of what I hear you talking about is, um, no, you know, you should fulfill your job description but the expectation for you to do more may not be fair. But if you want another position, if you want to advance, then you work and you perform at what the expectations are for the next position. It's like you dress for your next position, you perform for your next position. And you do it in a, in a way that's healthy for you and healthy for the organization. And you own it. You are responsible for you. I think that's such a huge thing. But I do want to get on to, we do a, a quick little uh, uh, lightning round, you can call it. And uh, it's just, again, quick responses. I'm not going to hold you to this permanently. Whatever answer you give is yeah. just the, you know, it's what you're thinking right now. And it doesn't define you. It's just a response. So the quick hitters and just give me your first thoughts that come up. First of all, I want to know what is your favorite book or media to give as a gift? What do you like to, what do you tend to hand out to people? What I tend to hand out to people? That's uh, a good question. I don't, I don't do a lot. Of, I don't do a lot of handing out. Um, but I will tell you one of the things I used to give as a gift often is the, the book Where the Sidewalk Ends. Is what, which one? Where the Sidewalk Ends. Oh, okay. The yeah, little so, Shel Silverstein. Yeah. I just it's just one of those things that Oh uh, yeah, that's great. You know, uh little little known fact. Um, you know the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue? Yes. Written by Shel Silverstein. No kidding. They were buddies. Oh wow. Um, he was a staff writer for Rolling Stone. I did not know that. Yeah. And I when I heard that, I was going, no way, it makes sense now. But yeah. yeah. Shell Silverstein, I, I used to uh, pull a lot of stuff for like opening up meetings or like uh, Shell Silverstein has some wonderful stuff yep. uh, in Where Do the Sidewalk Ends. All right. Now, I'm curious about if you could assemble a personal hero for yourself, like you can take parts from a ton of other people. Uh, what parts would you take from who and why? So you're assembling your personal hero. What would you do? Well, one of my personal heroes just passed on Friday, so Jimmy Buffett. Mr. Jimmy Buffett. Yeah. What would you take life. from Jimmy? Just a carefree lifestyle. Um, you know, enjoying the outdoors, uh, traveling the world. Um, you know, inspiring a lot of people. 
um, obviously on a pretty, pretty wide reach. Um, so definitely, definitely him. I would probably pull a little bit from my mother. Um, she was a, uh, she was a Cuban refugee, um, who essentially escaped, uh, when she was a young lady and, and just uh, was a, a pretty aggressive woman, um, as a Hispanic woman growing up. Um, you know, it was, uh, pretty impressive to watch. Um, so it takes a lot of resilience, a lot of courage. Um, so that's probably cool that resilience and courage, uh, from her. Um, same thing I probably pull a little bit, um, from, from my father, who was an entrepreneur, never worked for anybody else. Um, and just, you know, there's a significant amount of, um, drive behind what he did. Um, and, and everything that he did, we, he, he did it well. And then he, he had a lot of uh, people that admired him for that because he was a pretty, pretty significant uh, person in our, in our hometown. Um, so, I mean, I could probably pull from, from a handful of others, but that's really the only. That, that, that's great. I mean, I, if like, it must be in the blood, mom and dad, you, you reflect the things that you say your mom and dad gave you which is wonderful. I love the fact that not that Jimmy Buffett died, but so many people, so many parrot heads showed themselves, showed their feathers this past week. Um, and I got to say that that's, I've been to a ton of Buffett concerts. And if you want the spirit of, of uh, weirdness and love, go to the parking lot before a Buffett concert yeah. and see a three masted Cadillac and a, uh, a portable beach volleyball uh, uh, court, uh, hot tubs on the back of semis, yep. but also, and I do, I play guitar and Buffett is one of my go-to artists, but his books actually influenced me a ton. Song Lines by Bruce yeah. Chapman. He put that together in his song, Song Lines. So great stuff. Uh, last one. <clears throat> um who do you find yourself quoting most often? It could be a movie, could be an author, could be a leader. Um, and you're laughing, so don't be embarrassed if it's Fletch or Cable Guy. So, um, <laughs> you know, big fan of Slapshot, um, the, the hockey movie from the 70s. Um, so that a lot, probably um, Jaws a lot. Um, what from Jaws? Yeah, gonna need a bigger boat. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so mainly, mainly movies, I would say. Now, that's great. That's so when I asked, you know, my brother Jeff, I asked him this and he went right to Clint Eastwood, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and outlaw Josie Wales and, yep. you know, that kind of stuff. So great. Well, Lee, I, I, I hope that, um, People don't look at this interview and say, oh, it's just a corporate guy talking. It's There's so much more to what you have to offer. And I would say, hey, reach out to uh, Lee uh, on LinkedIn, find him, and um, get to know him if you want to find out about what it means to be an influential entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, because you don't just do, you don't just do the uh, two maids and a mop. You started something else too, right? Yeah, Beach Hospitality, and then I have a, a, another company that is commercial real estate. Yeah, so there's so much more that that you can learn from Lee, so reach out to him. And Lee, I want to thank you for taking this time today. Um, I enjoyed our first conversation since uh, since we were at Farmers. Man, this was great. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love following you on Facebook and LinkedIn. So thank you for being here. Yeah, I appreciate the invite. This was great. Good catching up.